Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about trusses. Trusses are the framework consists of multiple members that they can be used in roof structures, bridges, or other supporting structures. Here in the first image, I'm showing you a typical roof. So if you look at the truss, you can see that the loads are applied at the joints. And then we can orient the members in the direction of the loads so we can carry that load. With the truss, we have the flexibility to use many members and orient them in the direction of the load to have the highest load carrying capacity. The other typical example of trusses are the bridges. Here the bridge is used to carry cars and here uh, if you look at these sides you can see its corresponding truss and again because in bridges usually the loads are downward as the load uh, applied by the cars uh, therefore we can orient our members in the direction of the loads so we can carry that load and we could have different type of uh, designs to depending on our application before we analyze trusses we need to go over some of the assumptions that we are making in tr truss analysis the first assumption is that all loadings are applied at the joints so if you have the joints, the loadings can only apply at the joints. That means that we cannot have a load applied here. I mean, in real life, we have loads being applied in the middle of the member, but then we can't use truss analysis for that case. Then we have to use frame and machine analysis. That would be, that's what we are going to talk about later on. The other assumption is that the members are joined by smooth pins. So all these joints are smooth pins. That means that they do not have any uh, reaction moments. And the third assumption, which is the most important one, is that we are neglecting the weight of the truss members. Uh, because the loads that are being applied, these loads are going to be much higher than the weight of our truss members. So we can neglect this weight to make an, our, our analysis simpler. So it's up to you to decide whether that's a good assumption or not. Any assumption is going to introduce error for us. But as an engineer, we neglect some slight errors uh, to get simplification in our analysis. So that's the assumption that I want you to think about when you are uh, solving problems. Uh, the, four assum the fourth assumption, which results from the previous assumption, tells us that the members are either in tension or in compression, or in other words, there are two fourth members. So our members can be either in compression or they can be in tension. So tension is defined as if the force tends to extend the member, it is tensile force. So that's the member is in tension here. And this would be the compression. But remember that the members are connected by the joints. So if we have a member here, I have two joints, at one at each end. And if I want to draw a free by diagram for the whole member and the joints, if my member is in tension, these forces are being applied on the member by the joints. That means that my member is pulling the joints towards itself as a reactionary forces. So this is the complete free body diagram of the members and the two joints. So if you look at the member, it is obvious that the member is in tension because we have tensile forces here. But if you look at the joint, it might not be immediately obvious. That's why we are saying that if the force on the joint is towards the member, the member is in tension. Because if you are only looking at this, sometimes it's difficult to understand whether what's happening to the member. But our rule is that if the force is towards the member, that means that the member is in tension. Now we're gonna go into, look into the compression. So if you have a member that is in compression, if you're looking at the member, if you have compressive force, so the member is in compression. But if you look, if you look at the member with its corresponding joint, if the member is in compression, that means that this is the compressive forces that the joints are applying on the member. And the member has reaction forces. 
So it's pushing the member away at the reaction. So if you are looking at the forces on the joint, if the force is going away from the member, the member is in compression. So here the force is going away from the member. And that would be, in, that means that our member is in compression. There are uh, two types of analysis for trusses, the method of joints and the method of sections. We can analyze trusses using either method, but we are going to go over each method uh, to learn. Uh, so it, it, they serve as toolbox tools in our toolbox. And by looking at the problem later on, you would be able to uh, identify which method would be easier for you to analyze. But for now, we are going to start with the method of joints. So what is the method of joints is saying is that if the truss is in equilibrium, then each of its joint is also in, a, in equilibrium. So that's an important statement that our joints are also in equilibrium. That means that we could draw the free body diagram and write our equilibrium equation for each joint. So the procedure that we are going to use for analysis is listed here. We are going to start by analyzing the joint that only has two unknown forces. So if you look at our joints here, we have multiple options. We have joint D, joint C, joint B, joint A, and joint E. But we are going to select the joint that only has two unknown forces because that's all we can write in method of joints. We only have two equilibrium equations. Those are the fourth equilibrium equations. So I'm going to start with joint E because this is the external force. So we can think of it that this external force is given to us. So we can start with joint E. And the only two unknowns would be the forces from uh, member ED and member EA. So I'm going to start with joint E. That's the first step. Then we're going to draw the free body diagram of a joint. So this is my joint. I know the direction of the external force, which is 10 kN. Then I have two other forces. I have forces from member uh, ED that could be either in this direction or this direction. But looking at the free body diagram, I know something has to cancel that 10 kN. So it has to be in this direction. That would be my force ED. And if you assign an opposite direction, that would be fine. At the end, you get a negative value, and that means that your um, the direction that you assumed is incorrect. The other force that I have is member EA, that again, it could be either in this direction or the, the other direction. But according again to my free body diagram, I know something has to cancel this force FED, so this should go up. So that would be my force FEA. So looking at this free body diagram, I have two unknowns. So we've done uh, part two. Part three tells us that we can select a coordinate system. So usually we select the coordinate system before drawing the free body diagram, but here we are gonna select our coordinate system after we draw the free body diagram. And we could choose it, any type of uh, coordinate system in any direction that we want. Here, it seems that the typical coordinate system would be better because we have forces in X direction, we have forces in Y direction, and we have only one force that is not towards X or Y. But if for a free body diagram, you see that if you rotate your coordinate system, it would be easier for you to do the analysis. You can do that. And for each joint, we are going to draw a separate free body diagram because it's a separate set of equations. The fourth step is to apply the two equilibrium equations or to write our equilibrium equations. We have summation of forces in x equals zero and summation of forces in y equals zero. Because we have two equilibrium equations, we can only handle two unknowns. So for that, this example that I'm talking, if you write summation of forces in x, you have you can find FED. And after that, if you sum, write summation of forces in Y, you can find FEA. Remember, we do not have summation of moment equal zero here because a joint is a particle. And if you remember equilibrium of a particle, we could not write a moment equation because there is no dimension for a joint. So we are limited to two equations here in 2D. 
and then we can continue the analysis for other joints after we find the forces in our member. So after we are done with E, we can move to D. For D, now I have the forces in member ED, I need to find the other two. And once we are done, we could move to joint C and then continue our analysis until all our forces are, are found.